So the two talks uh, by Peter Jones and myself are basically intended to describe uh, two aspects of analysis that we have been struggling with. The state of the art at this point uh, should be viewed as a wilderness before, for example, topology was defined. We don't know what the right definitions are. We don't even know exactly what the problems are, but there are hints that some beautiful series lurk in the background. And those hints are the one I would like to convey. The main point uh, that we will address is the issue of effectiveness in computation. In other words, can we actually compute an analytic expression? Okay, or can we do better than analytic expressions, find new paradigms to describe analytical processes? Uh, and this is, by the way, not, uh, this is just a natural evolution from the calderon Zygmunt theory or, or the school, uh, the development of that school into, say, the area of computation. Uh, in that school, the pur purpose was not to invent theorems or to prove theorems, but more to develop methods to deal with certain issues. And so, in, in the same spirit, I'll try to describe uh, some examples that we think we know how to handle and point out to, 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 re to the real challenges. In effect, I think we are really at the, on, on the, in the topics I will describe, I think we are in the, at the pre-mathematical stage on many of the issues. Some of them we have some theorems, I'll describe them. Uh, the main issue, is sort of, so as to define it a little bit more precisely, the main issue is very much like the one that you confront in complexity theory, which is uh, the effective computability of an analytic expression. And again, as Gromov said, you may not be interested in computability per se, but it's a terrific mechanism to ask good questions and to gain insight. Okay? It provides you, if you want to be able to compute, I'll define effective in a minute. Okay? Uh, if you want to be able to compute an expression, uh, the question is, you, you ha and in an efficient fashion, uh, you have to be able to understand the organization of the computation as you go along. And it gives you an organizational principle and it gives you an insight. It's really a test of the understanding of what the expression does in a nuts and bolts kind of situation. You really know the components and how to fiddle with them. So it's a critical test of understanding. And in that sense, uh, I think it's an important question. I mean, whether or not you're interested in numerical analysis. In, uh, in Fourier analysis, we have seen such questions arise uh, the question that was very often asked was, can you prove an LP estimate or some Banach space estimate or things of that sort? Those were used also as tests of understanding, tests of organizations, and tests of, if you wish, nuts and bolts decompositions. The same thing happens on the much more fundamental issue of, can you compute the expression? Uh, in some sense, it's more natural, it's closer to Earth, and it arises already when you ask yourself, what is a function? And as usual, I mean, every now and then we start to redefine the notion of a function and, or re-examine it, I would say. And the issue is, uh, in what light should we re-examine it? What is it that the current notion does not provide us? And I will address uh, those issues. So let, let's come back to the effectiveness issue. Okay, so this is not the complexity, uh, the, this is not the computer science definition of complexity, it's a definition, a practical definition of complexity. Uh, we want to be able to, you take an approximate, you take an analytic object, a function, or an operator applied to a function, 
you approximate that object to some error uh, with, by using n, dis n discrete point or by some discretization, it need not be by just really sampling. And then you want to compute the, the answer to error to the same error in number of computations, which is proportional roughly. I mean, this would be, the best would be, I'm sorry, I, there's a misprint here. Uh, a terrible misprint. I mean, this log is not here. This is what is meant. Number of computations proportional to log 1 over epsilon, which is related to the precision, the number of samples, and another logarithmic factor. By the way, the difference between n and n squared is enormous. Okay? Uh, if you consider a, a practical PDE problem in which you have a box in 3D, with very low resolution, 100 by 100 by 100. Uh, if you do it in n squared, it's a million squared computation. And if you have to iterate this a few thousands or a few million times, uh, you're just dead. Okay. On the other hand, uh, very often the best you can do is n, some power of log n, and so on. So from my, from my point of view, I will just look at this restricted definition, sometimes we can't achieve it. We get n to the 3 halves, or sometimes if we get instead of n to the 6, n squared, we are happy. But uh, that does not, for small problem, it's OK. For the problem, the way they're scaling up, it's not OK at all. Okay? And it has nothing to do with the computer or the size of the computers. Uh, computers can grow to the point that you have as many processors as there are atoms in the universe. Uh, it will still take you several billion years to do this, a simple computation in hydrodynamics if you wanted to really do it precisely. And uh, that's not the issue. Well, you have an operator applied to a function, right? But you say you already have the object here, right? Do you mean you have the input data? The input. You have a function and you transform the function. So you compute a potential, you compute some linear transformation or nonlinear transformation on it, right? So there are really, there are lots of issues how you are going to is express this. So the function, the input is a function, the output is a function, say, okay? And what you want to do is be able to express the function in such a way that with n or n log n computations, the outcome uh, pops out with the same number of extra n log n computations. Okay. The precision, by the way, by the way, those problems could be hard problems from a complexity point of view. It's, it's an irrelevant issue as far as I'm concerned. The issue is that you want to get the answer in a given precision. Okay. If you wish from a complexity point of view, this is exactly one of those questions that Peter has dealt with. You may want to do traveling salesmen, but you just want to get the best curve up to a percentage of epsilon, so to speak. And then the issue is a different issue. So what, are the, what, what problems are, are we confronting? Uh, the first problem is uh, how to transcribe functions, how to describe functions uh, in a useful fashion. So let me now digress a little bit it's, it's, we are really at a stage, if you wish, on some level that existed before a decimal expansion of numbers existed. Uh, and it's a, in a very serious sense. And that is, before, suppose you had a number expressed even in a clumsy Roman notation, okay? And you need to compute its square root or multiply, or if it's not in a, in a it could be some other odd Mayan notation or something like that. Uh, even the Greeks, I mean, had a, uh, had a lot of trouble in this kind of computation. The issue from the point of view of automating or describing computation as a sequence of algorithms is that we want to be able to describe the function in a digital notation just in a similar way as we had the number. The, the, the advantage of having a digital notation is precisely that it provided the ability to automate uh, simple computation. Okay? You didn't have to have special rules or anything. With functions, there are some procedures of transcribing them which are automatic. Like, for example, take a function 
and expand it, assume it's a periodic function of period 2 pi, or just expand it in a Fourier series, or expand it in any other sort of orthogonal series. Uh, that's fine, except it doesn't, it doesn't respond to the problem, which is to do it efficiently. If the function you are trying to represent by a Fourier series uh, is a spike, okay, so it just a, a little looks like a Dirac, if you wish, then the Fourier series is infinitely long to get it to some precision. Okay, if you just if you wish just a characteristic function of an interval uh, to get a precision of one percent, uh, you will need uh, say a hundred terms uh, in the expansion. Okay, that's not very efficient. The object you are describing if it's a characteristic function of an interval, has only two jumps. You describe it with three numbers. Okay? What, the location of the jumps and the height. So the issue of describing a characteristic function of an interval in terms of a Fourier series is, is really, <laughs> it's really not the appropriate language to do it. In the same way, describing one eleventh in decimals in the it's very inconvenient. So the question is, there are always prices you have to pay. The point about, uh, actually the point you made is, is actually quite, quite important and interesting and it will come back. When you take a binary or decimal expansion, you have some numbers are not going to be efficiently represented. On the other hand, to a given precision, the cost is logarithm, logarithm of the precision. Okay, so it's not a heavy cost. Okay, while in what I've just described now, the cost is the one over the precision, okay, which is a tremendously larger number. Okay, so that's precisely uh, corresponds to what I said. So having a logarithmic cost is acceptable and, and unavoidable because there is an issue of automating. So the real question is, uh, how does one come about to describe functions in a way uh, which would be, uh, which would give us a, an efficient representation no matter what. Okay. So a few years back we thought we knew had the answer and the answer was, well, let's follow the paradigm of the musician. The musician describes a piece of music, not by developing it in a Fourier series but by writing the musical score. Okay. Now the musical score is much more subtle in some ways because it tells you that at certain instants a certain note is being played. A note is just a waveform or if you wish a cosine times some sort of amplitude and that particular note has a certain pitch and a certain amplitude assuming you are playing a single instrument. Okay. And you point and you write down on the score sheet that that note is present. And then there could be some other notes floating around which are at the same time underneath which are of different structure. They are longer notes with different pitches and different amplitudes. And so the musical score description of a piece of sound is one in which you have several notes floating on top of each other and transcribed. <coughs> Uh, I, will, I will show you examples of that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, I would also say that once you understand that you can write functions in this fashion, then you can reread, say, classical complex analysis in a different way. So not only am I doing applied mathematics, but I'm, I will provide some insight into a hundred years old classical fun uh, functional, uh, function theory, so, so to speak. Now, a musician, again, returning to this, a musician then will have a score of a given instrument playing at a given time. I'm going to mathematize the whole thing in a minute. Secondly, uh, when you're dealing with an orchestration, orchestra piece, that's not the way you do it. The musician will describe the piece of music as a combination of scores uh, played simultaneously uh, by different instruments. And the issue is, is there a mathematical version of that? Okay, and how does one do it, in effect, automatically? And is such a transcription the, the correct or a good analog? I mean, I don't know what correct or incorrect is. The question is, is it useful in some sense? 
I mean, either for understanding or for uh, computation. I should say that everything I'm saying uh, is classical harmonic analysis in the old sense. People have been doing this from time immemorial. The issue I'm addressing is can one automate the procedure? In other words, run it on a machine, do it without human intervention. Okay? And yesterday I was describing an example of this procedure. Let me, let me give it to you before I, I, I describe it some, somewhat more formally. And unfortunately, again, the projector here is not particularly strong. Can we lower the lights? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, this is worse. Which I tried it before. <coughs> yeah. This this little animal uh, has very intricate structure. It's a real orchestra piece. And the question is, can we write it as a way I've described as a superposition of scores? generated by different instruments. Okay? So that's the generalization of the musician transcription mode. I'll return to one dimension, but just to show you that it really doesn't make any difference. Okay, so here is a is a complicated image of a natural process which has a lot of a lot of ge geometries superposed on top of each other. There is a hairy stuff, there is a sort of human features in in him. Let's ignore the colors for a second. And, and there are other, other, other structures. So what happens is this. If we try to transcribe this object by using this musical transcription mode that I impressionistically described, uh, what you get is if you take a first layer, which is simple geometry, so to speak, and Alex, I, I can define this. Here it's basically synthesized it's really too bad. By just using a geometric multi-scale analysis or just using uh, wavelets, this is the same, the same image represented with one third of uh, one third of one percent of the number of parameters that were needed to represent the image in the first place. So this is 300 to one compression, as people say. And uh, this basically pulls uh, sort of the human features uh, of this mandrill, or say, say the, the uninteresting features of the mandrill. And what you see is basically just the shapes and the coloring, if you wish, in it. What we are missing is all the detail in the, in the hair and so on. And so this is essentially taking uh, a library of patterns, matching the patterns, uh, if you wish, an instrument matching the patterns uh, to the uh, to the picture that we get here, and extracting whatever is well described uh, by the original set of patterns. The residual is quite a bit more interesting. Okay, so this is what's left over from the picture, which itself is a complicated complicated uh, structure. It's a combination of many structures. And uh, he, as you can see, he looks pretty threatening uh, at this point. So let's decompose it into the hairy structure. So we take this residual and we try and see if there is an instrument that describes it uh, well. I mean, so here uh, the instrument is basically some sort of localized Fourier analysis in which the, the periodic patterns are seen and if you can see, you can see that the hair popped out, all the hairy structure popped out. It's exactly the structure which is, if you wish, the oscillatory structure in the in this object, and it all pulled out. And so that's a second layer. So the first layer was this sort of smeared watercolor, okay, which you can think as being synthesized by watercolor. And the second layer here is a layer which is a brush stroke type layer, okay, looks sort of like a Van Gogh synthesis. And the third layer is a pointillistic one in which we just have point corrections. Okay. The, original, the original image, if you wish, view it as an image or a function, 
it doesn't really matter. It's, it could be a fun it's the same thing. And uh, what you have here is a description, it's just the error, the error. This by itself could be analyzed further, but I mean, there's no point. I mean, if I, I could do the pencil and, and pull out all the, the strands there, and then I'll have sort of a random collection of points left after that. Okay, but you see what happened here is that sort of the, we get sort of three rough styles coming up just by attempting to do this transcription. The advantage of doing it, by the way, is that what we have done is represented the same, the same picture by, say, one third of one percent uh, of the, uh, no, but by, but by the time we go through the three layers, it's about three percent of the original data. Okay, and the representation is very quite accurate. Again, what it did for us is not that. The, the fact that we did compression here is, is interesting, but not, not the issue. The fact that is the issue is that we have taken a complex structure and really understood, in some sense, what, what collection of mechanism could have given rise to that particular structure. I'm a bit, you said the word library. Library sort of indicates that there's some a priori, I guess. Ah, uh, uh, yes. I will address this in, the, in, very, in great detail in a minute. The issue is when you do a representation, you have building blocks. And so the building, the, right, the question is what were the building blocks which I picked in this case, and are those, big, are those, are they universal, and for what, which kind of objects are the building blocks used, good for? And again, I will show you that although we were quite naive about this issue, and uh, there's a whole world of building blocks out there. Some of that, uh, with, natu with our natural instruments, we can't even perceive. Okay, so there are all kinds of parallel universes that we just don't know how to handle. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, in yes. Yes. Then you can you can code the bits. So let me add a question. Suppose uh, that you would apply compression to the original <coughs> picture, to how much would you reduce it? If you take the original picture and you do any sort of entropy or arithmetic coding on, on the data, you would get basically a two to three to one compression. When you do it this way, you go to thirty to fifty to one, depending on the error. Okay, the, 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 there is a difference though. When you do arithmetic coding or entropy coding, you keep all the bits. Here, I'm allowing myself to throw precision away. Oh, there is also lossy compression. This is lossy compression on purpose. Yeah, no, but also on, on the original picture, you do lossy compression, maybe with a meta I don't know what compression means. <laughs> okay. Uh, if, if you mean uh, finding some mechanism to store it efficiently, uh, you can apply, this is by far the best method. Maybe you postpone it for discussion. Yeah. No, it's by far the best method, by orders. So let's return to analysis for a moment. So if you wish, this was multimedia. Uh, if you look at this picture here, it looks somewhat like the mandrill. It's a simplified version of a piece of him. Okay, this actually arises if you just take the Green's operator to the Helmholtz equation uh, in two dimensions, in say, and in two dimensions, restricted to a curve, and it gives you a function of two variables are on the curve. So now I have a function. I basically have a, 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 a linear, the kernel of a linear transformation from one dimension to one dimension. I can discretize this and write the matrix for it, and I get this matrix. So this matrix, if I were to apply it to a vector, uh, would be ex the, the transformation itself. As you see, it's, it's a full matrix. I'll, this is not really the matrix I'll get. This is layer two in the mandrill decomposition. There will be a layer one which will give me something around the diagonal corresponding to the singularity of the Green's function, but which is not interesting, it's just a line. And layer two uh, is this layer. This is a Van Gogh type layer uh, in that decomposition I had before. 
And uh, layer three is just the error, as I, as I said. This is with some precision. And so the issue is, uh, again, how does one, uh, so what's the point? The point is that if I look at this as a matrix, and I want to apply linear algebra to apply this matrix to a given vector, which corresponds to the program I, I, I formulated before, it's a disaster. Because this matrix, in this case, is 512 by 512. So my n is 512. This is the degree of the uh, discretization. If I were to apply it to a vector, it will cost me 512 squared operations, so 250,000 operations, as opposed to the 512 times some constant that I wanted. Okay. On the other hand, if you look at the picture, it has very little information in it. In fact, it's a very simple picture. Okay. So doing linear algebra per se, is, is really, uh, is, which is a, a standard mode of operating, just does not work. Okay. Or works, but extremely badly. It's also sort of the same problem I described with the characteristic function of an interval uh, using Fourier series. On the other hand, it's rather clear when you look at this picture is that in the boxes that you see here, you see this is partitioned into a variety of boxes of various sizes. In each one of them, this really looks like a cosine of x dot some direction. Okay. So it's really an oscillatory uh, exponential, if you wish, in each one of the boxes with a particular orientation, more or less, in each box. And so it's, it's, it's rather clear that what you want to do is, in some sense, just represent the function in the boxes. So you take a partition like this into boxes, represent the function in each box as a specific cosine of x dot some vector. Okay. Uh, that would have the advantage, essentially, and, and a correction to that. That would have the advantage that instead of having 512 by 512 parameters to describe the picture, I will have basically four or five parameters per box, which corresponds to roughly 1,000 parameters instead of 250,000. Okay, so that's, that's useful, except it does not respond, correspond to the question which I asked, which is, uh, how does one apply this to a vector? Okay, and what happens when you apply it to a vector? Well, I can do this, pro this procedure. I can, in other words, I can devise rules that will permit me efficiently to take this object, this operator here, or this matrix, which is co coded, say, by a thousand number, apply it to a vector, but it corresponds to do the following thing. So this is not natural linear algebra. It's linear algebra in which you would take the vector initially. You will compute, you will lift it to a space which is not in Rn, but Rn log n. In that higher dimensional space, you would do a very simple, almost diagonal transformation. And then you would project back. And so this kind of computation will cost you exactly n log n. So in other words, what you've done is, taken this thing and unraveled it structurally into a much higher dimensional space in order to actually make it more efficient in computation. This is what this decomposition comes in. The transcription mode, by the way, is also on the board here. Uh, it's extremely simple. I could start out, I let, took, let, uh, look at this quad tree, as people say, or dyadic decomposition of the whole square. And I could take. Uh, for example, I can ask myself the following. Say, I look at those four little squares, and I can represent this object here, this function here, in terms of four uh, local trigonometric expansions. Compare this representation to the representation in terms on the big square, in terms of a single trigonometric expansion. If, the, if it's more efficient to use the four little squares, I'll keep the four little squares. Otherwise, I'll go to the next square. And then I take uh, this four intermediate size squares and compare them to their parent. Uh, obviously, it uh, didn't really work. And uh, here, the parent did a better job than the partitioning of the parent. So it's very easy to build computational schemes, which are extremely fast which will take an image like this, partition it automatically into segments, just by the criteria of how well you can approximate the object in those segments. And this will give you 
a rudimentary analysis of the picture. I will explain, if, if I have the time, how, does, how this really analyzes the picture. In the case of the Helmholtz situation. What would happen if you start not with this picture, but with Fourier transform of the picture, for example? The Fourier transform of the final field of the right. fourth, five, five, And just start, with, apply your algorithm right. to Fourier transform of the picture. Right. Will it be com it will it will be a comparable result. It will be essentially the same result. This is all the theory I'm describing is by definition self-dual. Okay, it doesn't really matter whether you work in Fourier space. You're constantly switching back and forth between Fourier space and original space, but at different scales of the image. Okay, so this is basically local Fourier expansion, which is a self-dual thing. Think of a Gaussian times an exponential. It's Fourier transform. It's the same. And that's what the kind of basic objects we are using. Okay. The issue is how do you adjust the object to the geometry that you're dealing with. Uh, this relates, this by the way, relates to basically uh, dynam the dynamical system of, of the billiard on, on, a cur on, a, on a table which has a boundary which is a curve, if you wish, and this is sort of the geometric optic version of that. Okay, so uh, how, do you find, how do you understand the geometry automatically is a good question, and the various circles that you get and so on represent interactions and beam forming and curvatures and so on. This is all, each, each one has a meaning. I, uh, it'll take many hours uh, to, to go through it, but it's, it's not, that's not the issue. The issue is that dealing with a picture in the first place and dealing with the understanding of the operator that is underlying this picture here uh, are very similar procedures. And the issue is how does one do, do this uh, transcription? So. I'm essentially, this is the transcription thing. The, there are lots of, uh, in terms of transcriptions, there are lots of issues. Actually, let me go back one step here. What I've described is a relatively mildly complicated object. Uh, the question is, how do you transcribe or, or how do you describe, if you wish, the kind of measurements or physical measurements you would get uh, when you look at turbulent flows or when you measure uh, any sort of mechanical, physical, vibrational uh, uh, effects. Uh, usually what you measure is extremely complicated. You have thousands or millions of parameters involved. Uh, if you're dealing with a turbulent flow, uh, you're basically immediately out of this universe in terms of computational <coughs> capability. And uh, it's not clear that you're really doing the right thing. Uh, what is indicated in what I've described is that you have various orthogonal bases that you can use. You can sort of rotate whole collections of orthogonal bases in, uh, in space to fit an image. When I described the mandrel, I said, well, I take the mandrel and I described it in three different orthogonal bases. There are three structures in it. Each one of them is described in that particular basis. Uh, the fact that you can do it means that the whole, con the whole idea of a moving frame in function space or in high dimensional space is one that you can apply to a variety of dynamical problems uh, like maybe turbulence or maybe some other evolutions and with the hope that you are going to split the mechanism into the, the motion of the frame on the one hand and the description of your field in a given frame on the other hand. Just like people were doing with say rigid bodies which is sort of trivializes a lot of the of the operation there. Here the, what we are providing initially is some way of describing moving frames. I've seen some numerical experiments to that extent and they looked very impressive and I thought that this was complete bullshit. And tried to check on some examples like nonlinear Schrodinger and so on uh, where, whether uh, this kind of procedure works and it not only does it work but one can prove that it works and that there is a very natural moving frames of the kind I've described here where if you take 
a situation, say you have a large number of soliton coming together and garbling each other and interacting, it looks like a horrendous mess, the number of parameters needed to describe the system in a moving frame is almost constant. But when you say moving, it depends just on the time. On the time, right. So for each time step, you have a different representation. Right, right. For each time space, you have a different representation of the data. Okay. And, and that's the issue is which representation you, you pick, but just picking the most efficient one in terms of description of the data that you're dealing with has a property that the description length of the data is almost constant in time as you go along. Then you have to describe the frame. That's another story. So okay. It, it but it's not so hard in some examples. But this means some is a flag of subspace, which is invalid. Means some property of the structure. It, right, right. Now, now, okay. Let me address one of the questions I was asked before, which is, what is it about this library of sort of local Fourier, uh, Fourier things that makes it efficient or effective in in physical situation? Well, it has to do with the fact that uh, very, very much normal modes and eigenvec eigenfunctions of uh, elliptic operators basically look locally like uh, essentially exponentials. And uh, that's sort of the key. That's the reason why this works. Uh, I, will very, I can very easily generate uh, physical systems of the kind that, uh, uh, say, ergodic flows of the kind that uh, Cohen was looking at and so on, where the, the eigenfunctions, when you quantize the systems, are such that when you try to analyze it this way, you get garbage, no matter, no matter which way you, are, you arrange it. Because phase, plane, phase space is being completely filled up. And this is a phase space analysis of the objects, and you'll get garbage. So the question is, how do you get anything that's not garbage? So you need to invent a new analysis to do that, and some of them exist. Some of them exist in some situations. In fact, well, we can discuss it. They are incredibly interesting it, it issues. Is similar to what physicists in quantum field theory do when they introduce something in between the Schrodinger and Heisenberg picture. I don't know. I, I can't answer that. I, I don't know whether it's similar or not similar. I mean, what I'm saying here is just a reformulation of stuff that everybody has been doing in some sense, except that the goal of this exercise is to make it completely and totally automatic, just like digitizing numbers. Okay? And do it that way. You want to automate the, the description of the function. So if I take a say, an evolution of a turbulent flow, for example, or a nonlinear Schrodinger equation, or anything like that, I want at each step the transcription of the answer or the field that I'm describing to be automatically described to me. I mean, I can think it, but very often what I think is very limited. As somebody said, we can think seven numbers <laughs> or whatever, but that's, that's not the issue. We have discussion in 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, we have a discussion all along. All right. So let me switch gears for a moment, uh, going from transcription to the next stage, which is the issue that this is actually very vexing and unpleasant. Every doctor and every physicist or every scientist when they try to describe, uh, look at some natural function, whether it's a doctor trying to do a diagnostic and he has your blood pressure, sugar content, uh, body weight, and maybe five or six or seven other parameters, needs to be able to infer from this collection of parameters something about the state of your health. Okay. Whether you're a doctor or you're just doing any, any physical, complicated physical system, uh, you're going to have to deal with functions, say, of more than 10 parameters. Okay. The question is, what do we know about such functions? And the answer is zero. In other words, when I say no, I mean in terms of effective description of those functions or computation of those functions. What I'm trying to say is this. If I take a function of 10 variables and you look up such a function and uh, what, what you might be want to do with such a function, expand it in a Fourier series or expand it in any sort of series for that matter, 
And the function you know is relatively decent, maybe has a few derivatives, the derivatives are bounded and so on. And you ask yourself, how many terms would I need to get an approximation to order epsilon? Well, if the function only has one derivative, uh, you will not do any better than taking 1 over epsilon to the dimension. If the dimension is higher than 10, okay, and your precision is 1 half, you already have 1,000 terms for nothing. Basically, you haven't gained anything. Okay. If you, just to, sh to shock you even further, if you ask yourself, what, is, what good is a, to, is a Taylor polynomial? Well, x to the power 20 is a function which is 0, 1, and infinity. That's the only values it takes. Okay. So, I mean, we are, dealing, we are sort of being in a fantasy world, thinking that, uh, say, the Weierstrass approximation theorem is useful for something. It's, I mean, the fact that polynomials approximate everything is a very useful and important fact. I mean, you may have a function having a thousand parameters on it, and you can approximate it by a polynomial of degree a thousand, but it better be an orthogonal set of polynomials. The Taylor expansion is pure trash as far as this is concerned. Okay, it just doesn't do anything. Well, the reason is that multiplying a lot of small numbers gives you something exponentially small. If you are in higher dimension, dimension 10, and you ask yourself, I want to approximate a function by a polynomial. Well, most of the products are going to be zero. Okay. So the function of higher dimension is really going to be a, a lot of a sum of a lot of functions of low dimensions, like pro short products of x1, x2, x3, or x3, x5, or things of that sort. And we have no clue about which functions in dimension 10, I'm not even going to dimension 250,000 that I described a minute ago, which functions actually can be effectively used or computed or modeled for that matter. So it looks hopeless. Uh, on the other hand, there are some theorems uh, that are pretty decent, indicating that there, is, there might be a subtle theory uh, floating there and so let me, uh, let me go to describe it. The theorem of Stromberg, which I'm sure was known to other people. That's not the issue. It's, it's essentially an illustration that there is something there, which says that if you have a function from Rn to R, and it, it doesn't have to be very regular. I mean, it satisfies the nth uh, mixed derivative is bounded. This means any product of function of x1 times functions of x2 up to function of xn, where each one of them is, has a bounded derivative, will satisfy that condition. Okay. So for such a, in such a situation, uh, it's extremely elementary to prove that you can expand such a function as a sum of hr uh, AR, HR. ARs are number, numbers. Uh, you can expand it to R or epsilon. R are dyadic rectangles, that is, rectangles which are product of dyadic intervals, of area exceeding epsilon. And the error is going to be larger than epsilon, uh, it's less than epsilon. The number of such rectangles is uh, 1 over epsilon times log 1 over epsilon to the, to the power n minus 1, which is very, very unfortunate. But it's still infinitely better than other procedures, which will give you 1 over epsilon to the power n. So for modest dimensions, this is actually a useful theorem. It's h. Hmm? It's h. h are Haar functions. A Haar function is a function which is equal to uh, plus 1 on the interval 0 and a half, minus 1 on the interval uh, minus a half to 1 and 0 elsewhere, and h r r is a tensor product corresponding to the edges of the rectangle. Right. So it's a tensor product. In Rn, it will be the tensor product of the Haar functions rescaled to the dyadic intervals uh, forming uh, whose product is equal to r. It, it doesn't matter. One can do much better. It's, it's not so much the issue. The question is, what is the moral of the story? You see, the counting here is by the area of rectangles. So 
There are some fixed bases. This is actually an orthogonal expansion here. Yes, but the number of terms is surprisingly low, and what they tell us is another surprising fact, which is that the only rectangles that appear there, bear in mind the area of a rectangle is the product of the lengths of the edges and uh, of the sides, right? And if you have a lot of them which are size a half, <laughs> area is smaller than epsilon. If epsilon is one over a thousand, more than 10 at the time will be below precision. Okay, so we're coming back to the point I made before that you can, most of the variables are not present in each one of the terms. Okay, if you look at each one of the terms, uh, they are, if they are localized, then there is activity or there is no activity whatsoever in that particular variable. Okay, so in, in any, I mean, this is not, there are several aspects of this particular theorem which make it not very useful uh, except as a guide. One of them is that it's very much dependent on the coordinate system. If I were to take a function like this and rotate it, I destroy the condition. So the challenge here is to be able to identify the coordinate system relative to which such a representation is valid. And even, where, even more, uh, you don't expect that a single coordinate system will work. You expect a superposition of coordinate systems, which corresponds again to what I did with a mandrill on some level. Okay, and the question is how do you find those coordinate systems and how do you do the localization? That's an issue that Peter is going to address on some level uh, geometrically uh, in, the next, in the next lecture. So in, in a way, it's somewhat of an introduction. Let me just illustrate, uh, I, I'll finish with that, with the following situation. In two dimensions, this is actually a useful theorem even in two dimensions. Okay, so let's understand this, everybody can see. Suppose I want to compute the integral of a function. So I have a function, say, probability, the probability density function. And I want to compute, so to say, the integral of the function. Let me go to this thing. OK, so I want to compute the integral of a function on this particular square ending at a given point here with precision 1 over 64, OK? Uh, then I will need to have a, a grid which is as fine as this one to get that particular precision. The number of points in this grid is 4,096. On the other hand, the theorem I just formulated tells you that all you need to do is compute the integrals over this collection of rectangles, OK? And if I know the integral over this collection of rectangles, there are only 448. Okay. Before, I needed to compute an integral over each one of the little squares. There are 4,000 little squares. Here, I just need to, to know the integral over each one of the square rectangles here. Those are precisely the rectangles whose area exceeds 1 over, sec, 1 over 64, rather than the pointwise situation. So you see, already in two dimensions, there's a substantial difference. I mean, and it's exponentially growing with the dimension. The, the, the ratio is, I mean, you're going from 1 over epsilon to the power dimension to 1 over epsilon to the power 1 times the logarithmic term of, we an exponential logarithmic term in the precision, but for low precision, low dimension, it's okay. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm through here. Uh, let me just, one more word. This is just an indication that there might be something to think about. Uh, it's a critical issue. I mean, this is sort of baby analysis of the, of the simplest kind. I mean, how do, you do, how do you represent a function? Ten parameters is, is not a lot. The challenge of how to deal with 250,000 or a million uh, is, is, another, is another challenge. And maybe next century or maybe uh, earlier, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Is there any? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Please ask questions, but keep in mind that in an hour we have an uh, extended so discussion. discussion. Yeah. Please. Uh, uh, is there an effective analog in the sense of Sartre's theory? What? Yeah, there is. There is. He's going to talk yeah, about that. Talk about yeah. That. Yes. Uh, but what me, I mean, I know that uh, imagine that this 
difficult to represent functions, but how you want to represent probably depends on what you want to do with them. Yeah, absolutely. If you just want to integrate it, I guess maybe it's not so hard. Right. Right. It's, I, I, I wrote it down and neglected to say it. All representations are for a given purpose. Okay. So that makes the problem slightly more complicated. Uh, the purposes that occur naturally that uh, we should view as part of analysis is you may want to associate with a function just one or two parameters which are sufficient to discriminate it from another function. Right? That's one kind of representation. You may want to represent the function uh, efficiently so as to be able to process it further. This is what happens when in the geophysical exploration business. You really don't care whether it's a good representation or not as long as the outcome of the computation is what you're looking for. Uh, the the, you're right. Uh, representation is always a function of the task you're asking. I just described representation from the point of view of approximation with the least number of bits. Okay. But there are other types. Okay. Yes? Uh, this is true. This is, you said seven years ago you thought you, 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 you have an answer. What happened? What happened is this. I thought that this kind of adaptation of this sort of for local Fourier analysis uh, might give us some clue of what the complexity of a function is and the amount of information in it. Uh, in fact, it gave us a lot of clues on a lot of problems, and several classical uh, analytic problems, classical problems in analysis, actually, uh, it shed a lot of light on and enabled the sol uh, solving them. On the other hand, we found out that there are enemies to this kind of representation. There are structures. Uh, which arise incredibly naturally, in fact, in the representation theory of discrete uh, groups or some Heisenberg uh, groups on finite fields or something like this, which when you represent them as functions, sort of discrete functions, and you try to analyze them by, Fourier, by this kind of local Fourier analysis, they always look like noise. It seems like white noise. So you can, I can, there is a structure here which I did not describe, and there is a parallel structure in a different organization, I mean the same organization, but different building blocks, so to speak, so that if I were to code in that structure, everything looks like pure noise. I mean, it's a beautiful uh, spread spectrum code, if you wish, or something. But the point is that you cannot analyze it in conventional f ways. And those structures are very common when you ever, whenever you quantize, for example, a a Hamiltonian which has say ergodic flows and you get you look at the eigenfunctions of that of uh, of the corresponding unitary operators they will all lo always look like noise so you will never be able to use this analysis to describe them you'll have to build a separate analysis maybe some of the kind of things that Alain Cohn is doing I don't know but that's another challenge okay so it's relative